Well, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I'll try not to look at the microphone. It's like moving, it's following me around. Uh, but I want to welcome you to Learning and Retirement, our summer session, which is Interesting Lives. And just want to tell you today, I have the pleasure of sharing a conversation, and that's what we hope it'll be, uh, with Adrian P Peterson. And we didn't really know each other before this, which was, has really been, we didn't, it was just one, you know, we've didn't cross paths as much and we have just thoroughly enjoyed i have certainly thoroughly enjoyed uh, getting to know a little bit about her and and sharing commonalities uh, our conversation will last about 45 minutes and i'll try to keep an eye on the on the clock and if i don't someone else can go uh help me out there and then there'll be a time for questions and carolyn and bill are going to help us out with the microphone and so i'll give you a little bit more instruction when we get there but i think first I just talked uh, to Adrian and, and asked her, well, tell us about growing up. What was that like? That, from your accent, I learned that it didn't really sound like you were from around here. I, I, well, I was born in London. In fact, I was English until I was 30, about 29. Um, anyway, I was born during the Second World War in a semi-detached in South London. Uh, we had an Anderson shelter, uh, a shelter in the ground, uh, and air, anti-air raid guns at the bottom of the garden, uh, and it was the Blitz. And we hung in there until my mother couldn't take it anymore. We, when the planes went over, the, the Germans had designed them to go, Gee! so you could hear them coming. And she could take that and she'd go under the stairs rather than in the Anderson shelter. But then the Germans started using buzz bombs, the, 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 the rockets, the, the V1s and V2s. And they came across and then they stopped and then they dropped. And that drove my mother crazy. So then we moved out of London. Meanwhile, my father was a navigator in the RAF, uh, navigating bombers. And subsequent uh, expeditions with him in the English Channel led us to suspect he seldom found Germany. But that's <laughs> another story. Um, after the war, my father was in the occupying forces in Germany. I was five. And my parents, in their wisdom, sent me to a German village school. So you might say it was German immersion. Unfortunately, we were in a requisitioned house, uh, which had belonged to some of the other people in the school. So I wasn't the most popular kid on the block. And I was always in detention for misplacing my umlauts, which anybody who knows German will understand. Now what's what's that? An umlaut, it's the little dots over the O. Oh, OK. Yeah. Uh, so that was it for a year. I came back to England and then I started school proper and we lived in Southampton. My dad was still working for the government because we still had rationing until I was 10. So dad was a Ministry of Food Inspector. And the only really big thing that happened then was my brother was born. So my brother's eight years younger than I. Um, at 10, rationing finally stopped. My father was out of work. And he decided the best way to earn a living was to actually buy the franchise of a public house, a pub. Uh, so he borrowed from the family and we bought a pub in a place called Farnham in Surrey. And it's still there. And you can go on Google and look it up because the dentist did. Um, and it's called The Six Bells. And it's now a gastro pub. At the time we were there, it was a standard family pub. It had been built in 1620 as a coaching inn. Uh, and behind the main building, there was a stable yard. And there were stables along two sides. And they had been converted to garages, which we leased out. Uh, and there was dry rot and mold, and there was a, a cave underneath uh, in which we stored the beer. And it, it was whitewashed. It was quite coos, but it was a cave. Uh, so that was an interesting upbringing. The most interesting was that we ran it as a family, uh, so that we worked from 10 to 2, or my parents worked from 10 to 2 and 6 to 10 every day of the year, except for Christmas night. So 
and we ran it kind of as a family thing. My job when I was 10 was picking up after people in the garden where we had swings and tables and all that good stuff uh, and sorting the bottles into the right crates to go back to the right suppliers and stuff like this. And at 12, I stepped up to being a barmaid. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was always amazed because um, people were so nice to me. And I didn't realize how nice until I actually... Um, decided to go and earn real money rather than pocket money. And I went to a local door factory because I was cutting um, beading because I could count and measure. Uh, and I went home after about the second day and I said to your dad, what does, and it's a four letter word, which I won't tell you, mean. Uh, and he, that was the last day I went to the door factory actually. <laughs> and, and, I had not realized how much of a hold my father had on our regulars because I had never heard language like that at all. And nor did I, you know, and, and by the time I went to university, my brother was 10 and then he picked up. And you know, so we were always a family concern who were always working. That had uh, a, an impact on both of us. Both of us actually did. We're not, we decided neither of us were hugely smart, but we are terrifically hard workers. In the English education system, they do a kind of sort, particularly after the war, uh, and it has changed now. Um, they did a sort at 11 called the 11 plus, and they sorted one third of the kids went to grammar school, two thirds went to secondary school. The grammar school was essentially the fast track. Uh, and then at 15, you did something called ordinary level general school certificate, uh, O levels. And rather than doing it generically, and rather than doing it sort of the, 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 the sort of question thingy that I have here, you wrote essays and drew maps and yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, and at that point in England, most people left school uh, and went out into business. Then we had something called advanced level. And that, that actually qualified people to go to teachers' training colleges to do elementary education and stuff like that. And also to go to some universities. And then we had something called scholarship level, which enabled you to work your way to a better kind of university. And if you wanted at that point, you could do entries to Oxford or Cambridge. And personally, since I came from a pub, I was kind of worried about the class system. So I didn't want to go to Oxford or Cambridge, but I did want to go to London University. So anyway, got through the education system. I've got 13 O levels. So people say, have I ever done art before? And the answer is yes, I've got art at O level. You know, and we did French, math and geography and yada, yada, yada. After that in the English system, that's it, goodbye general stuff. I did pure mathematics, applied mathematics and physics from 15 onwards. So I did it for A level, got it with distinction. We had didn't have hugely good science teachers at, our, oh, I big thing I should say, this was an all girls school in uniform. It's the only way to go when you're a teenager, <laughs> the only way, because you're not competing in clothes and boys. And did I interact with boys? I went to a youth club. And the answer is, of course, I did, but, you know, not at school. Um, but to get scholarship level, it seemed like a smart idea also to learn how to work with boys. So I went to Guildford Technical College. Uh, and that's where I did my scholarship level. And I met my best friend ever, Penelope Ann Yates Mercer. Uh, and and we'd been friends ever since. Um, got decent scholarship marks. One thing Penn and I found is that guys didn't know as much as they pretended to. <laughs> so, <That's right. laughs> so we figured out a really obscure part of physics. And the day before our physics exam, we, we went waltzing in to where, where, where everybody was sort of messing around. And we talked about, hey, this was really likely to be on the exam paper. And we watched them go white. And, and, and that was it. So uh, um, at that time, only about 5% of kids 
went to university. And um, it was a, a, a system which was encouraged to bring working class kids like me in. So they had a scholarship system where they, the scholarship sort of supplemented your parents' income. So I got a full scholarship. My The person who was later my husband was at the same college, but he had a father who was a consultant psychiatrist and he got virtually nothing. So that, that was where it was. Um, there were five girls and about 50 guys in my class. Um, and eight of us were late for the first lecture. Two sets of two later married. Margaret married Colin and I married Gethin. And you know, so that was, I don't know what the other four did. Um, and you know, the college was nice. We we enjoyed it. We spent four afternoons a week in the lab, and again, we did pure mathematics, applied mathematics, physics. Had to do some shop, but the guy there was so sweet, and I I was a girl, so you know he'd say, "Oh, I think you'd find if you do it this way," and there would be the the nut or the bolt or whatever it was I was supposed to be machining suddenly there, which was perfect. Um, I got together, I, I got first class honours in physics. It was a university wide thing. I should say London University has a number of colleges, University College, King's College, where my brother in law went, some Queen Mary College, where my brother went, uh, London School of Economics, Royal Holloway, yada, yada. And this has grown because places like London Polytechnic have now joined too. So when I was there, there were 29,000 students in, in London University. Now I looked it up, there are about 210,000. Wow. And a lot of the the college, the, the things like the teachers training college and the um, uh, at London Poly have now become colleges of London University. Oh, I should say, London, we don't wear, we don't wear sweaters with names on London University, University College. So when you <laughs> when when you see scarves in London, they're, they're, you've got to be able to read them. <laughs> anyway, so then I got first class honors in physics. I was actually second in the university in physics, not because I'm smart, but because I'm so insecure. I spent Christmas and Easter vacations during revision, going through all the books, all the questions, and yada, yada. And, I, and I just spent longer time than anybody else, so that's just the way it was. Um, University College was known for nuclear physics and space, which is kind of nuclear physics, and I'm going to talk about that later. So I joined the space group, as did my to-be husband, Gethin, and we, we, we our, our PhD uh, thesis was on two sound was involved two sounding rocket payloads, which we had to launch from Woomera in Australia because early on they had tried launching uh, rockets from Wales and killed a couple of sheep. Um, in, in in Woomera, we actually always had to have, pay a little bit extra for the sheep that our rockets always killed. Somehow, in all that space in the middle of Australia, the farmers always managed to place a sheep right where your rocket came back. So, you know, it was just business as usual. Um, but it, it took about five years to do that stuff. And in between, Gethard and I also did some work on, uh, um, on an experiment on a spacecraft for uh, America and the orbiting solar observatory two or something like that. Uh, and we went and gave a paper in Russia on the sort of detectors we were using in our payloads. And that was kind of funny because being grad students, we had a bright red Spitfire <laughs> car with, with a soft top, which we took course to Leningrad and we went you know across the channel and then through Belgium and up through Denmark and then through Norway and Sweden and Finland and got to the R Russian border and they kind of said what do kids like you do really with it or why you've got this this thing you know this 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 wonderful toy and it was only because we had visas saying that we were honored scientists going to give a paper in Leningrad that they let us through but we had you, 
negotiated with Intourist a tour that went from from uh, the border to Leningrad. And then after the conference, we were going to go to Moscow and Minsk and out through Eastern Europe. Well, after we hit the, the, the border, we went through thick gravel, thick, loose gravel, and our little car only had two inches clearance. So I got out and walked because firstly, Gellin was the better driver. And secondly, I hate to admit, he was slightly lighter than I was. So he drove the car and I walked alongside. And we got to the, the border town, which was called Yuli Vaipula. And the, 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 the walls were still marked and the, 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 um, the, the manhole covers stood about 10 inches above the road. And of course our little car was two inches above the road. So as we drove down to Leningrad, we decided that for sure we couldn't come back the other way because we were supposed to be doing 500 miles a day. So we spent the whole of the two week period negotiating with interest to let us to go back the way we came. And, and we fortunately did. While we were there, there were about 10 foreign cars of which ours was the most ostentatious, probably the cheapest, but the most ostentatious. And we had our own guard who would stood night and day of different guards, but to, to stop people stealing it. And he made a bucket while we were there because he would allow people to pose by it. Well, I've... anyway, so that, that, that was that. First time we tried to launch our rocket in Australia, everything was going beautifully. And we had tested everything we were going to launch the next day and the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia. And you may say, what has got this, this got to do with a launch in Australia? And the answer is the guy who was supposed to be charging the batteries on our rocket was Czechoslovakia. So he, he dealt with the situation as many people do. He drank himself blind that night and didn't charge our batteries. And we didn't realize this till our rocket, rocket had launched and launched looked wonderful. But the signals that were supposed to be going up were going down because the battery was dying. So we packed up and went home. We still had one more chance, the second payload. And so we got that ready. And the next year we went out and this time everything worked. Well, this time I actually knitted through the light like Madame Defarge uh, while I watched the battery being charged because that wasn't going to happen again. <laughs> um, and we launched and that was lovely. And we got our PhDs and immediately brain drained to America. Now, it seems a shame because England had invested particularly in my education, which my dad had thoroughly encouraged. And I forgot to say that. <laughs> um, but Mrs. Well, but England was getting out of space because it really wasn't very cost effective for them. Uh, and um, Gethin, my husband, was known for his technical capabilities, as he should have been, and was offered a job at Harvard College Observatory. So I, I went along too, and I had to interview when I got here. And I ended up with about four job offers because you, know, you went along and made a presentation about what you'd done in the respect. Um, one was a radio telescope outside uh, Boston, which looked kind of neat, but one was in a company in uh, Cambridge, which is where Harvard is, and it looked really neat. It was a company that was called American Science and Engineering, uh, what locals called it American Sicilian and English. Now, the Americans, I don't have to talk about the English, the other English person was a chap called uh, John Davis, who, who did their sounding rocket program. The Sicilian, um, the big boss was um, Bruno Rossi from MIT. His second was Riccardo Giacconi from MIT. And my boss was Pippo Vianna, who was probably the Sicilian actually when it comes into it. And then I had Giancarlo Nocci, uh, and um, people companio working for me. So you can see, and this is why I talk like this, of course. Because, you know, when you talk, when you work with Italians, you talk. <laughs> so, uh, um, and that's where I started um, doing real solar research. Now, did I cover the first three things? You did. We're good. We're good. We're good. See, we got there. 
Okay, so now I can now I can geek. Yep, now you All can right. geek. In order to understand what I do, I'm going to have to geek. Those of you who are scientists, just go to sleep for five minutes because I know I, it's going to be too simple for you as possibly too complex and certainly too boring for everybody else. I'm going to define really five things. Atoms. Uh, the, the, the atom is composed of a nucleus which has got positive ions, neutrons and electrons winding around it, right? When you excite it, the electrons wing to a different orbit, not an arbitrary orbit, a specific orbit. And then they sometimes give up their energy and wing back to where they're supposed to be, and they give out electromagnetic energy. Isn't that nice? If you hit them hard enough, one of the electrons goes off, and then you've got an electron and a positive ion. Perfect. All right, that's it. Second thing, waves. When the electrons bounce up and down between their orbits, they give out pulses of electromagnetic radiation, otherwise known as light. So since they all have distinctive signatures, if you know how to do it and you look at the light they emit, you know what they are and what kind of... I'm not going to look at you because you've got your mouth open. Um, he's, a, he's a scientist. I'm, I'm just, just ignoring Um the thing is that you can look at light in two ways. You can look at it as particles and you can look at it as waves. We're going to look at it as waves. Forget about the particles. Um, we're looking at each other in visible light, right? Her shirt is pink because it's reflecting pink or the wavelengths that make it look like pink. Okay. Um, the light out here looks white. But it isn't. And if you think about it, you know it isn't, because if you see a rainbow, you see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that's because the white light is being diffracted with the raindrops into, re refracted by the raindrop, um, into some of its composite colors. And the more carefully you look at that, the more you can see all these different spectral lines and continua and stuff like that. And that tells you a lot about the... Uh, um, the makeup of the source from which the light came. I'm telling you this because most of my work is done in what's called the extreme ultraviolet. Visible light is here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, right? Red is the weakest, blue is the strongest in terms of the energy it carries. At the weekend, then come infrared, microwave, radio, yada, yada. This end, blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. And they're all the same thing. They're just different frequencies. They carry different energies. You're still looking. At... Stop looking at me like that. <laughs> he's, a, he, he's a rocket scientist. Ignore him. I'm going to try to. Anyway. Anyway, so we were working. The, the thing that you, 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 we are really lucky. Well, I'm going to. I'm just going to stop there because I'm going, to, I'm going to introduce another thought first. Magnets. You've all seen a bar magnet, North Pole, South Pole. Some of you have probably done the experiment where you sprinkle iron filings all over it, and you see these neat lines going from the North Pole to the South Pole. Out. Uh, that's what you need to know about magnets, actually, because the next thing I'm going to talk about is the sun. And if you look at the sun at any time, it's a swirling mass of gas. It's actually a boring G-type star, but it's our boring G-type star. And without it, we wouldn't be. So anyway, because it's gas, it, and it also rotates about its axis, the, the, the middle bit rotates faster than the higher latitudes, OK? And if you look at it at any one time, it appears to have a magnetic field uh, no, going through it. And I'm not being specific about the polarity because it's the sun is fascinating. But before I talk about the magnetic field, when you look at the sun uh, in visible light with the appropriate equipment, not with your eyes, you see little spots. And at the moment, if you look at it, you're probably quite a lot because I think it's nearly solar maximum. I say solar maximum, with about an 11 year periodicity, you get few spots, more, 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 they drift towards the center and then they kind of disappear for a while and then they start up. 
And I did it this way because what happens is that the overall magnet magnetic field of the sun actually switches. So the, the sunspots come and go with a 11 year periodicity. The sun's magnetic field switches backs and forwards. So it has a 22 year old, 22 periodicity. And that's fascinating. But anyway, those little sunspots, if you look invisible, they're spots. The sun's atmosphere cools briefly and then gets hotter and hotter. And it's not really apparent why, but those spots are really uh, the magnetic field popping through the visible surface. And above that, it, it reconnects again and somehow traps the outer gas. And the temperature of the sun actually then increases um, to hundreds of thousands of degrees until millions of degrees. So the sun actually, as you see it, emits both ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, and X-ray radiation as you go on out. Uh, and that is important because if some of that hit us, we would be uncomfortable if not dead. Oh, the sun also emits particles, charged particles. The solar wind coming out from the sun all the time. A lot of it, though, is trapped by the loops of the magnetic fields reconnecting to each other. Last thing, the Earth. The Earth also has a magnetic field, which is a jolly good thing, because like the bar magnet, the field lines protect us like a womb. The sun, so the Earth's field doesn't change. It stays north and south polarity. You've always got the magnetosphere around you and it's protecting you from those charged particles that the sun is sending out and from cosmic rays coming in from other places. It does wing it in out and out a bit in response to how strong the, 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 the emission solar wind is. So you can think of it as bouncing around a bit. And you know when there's a lot of activity in the wind because you see aurorae. And this is because at the top, like a bar magnet, the lines of force actually are open and the particles find their way in and down into the atmosphere and they ionize. Remember, ionize is kicking off one of those electrons. They ionize the atmosphere and you see these wonderful displays. Right? So the other thing, the, 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 the X-rays, the extreme ultraviolet and the rest of it could harm us too. And you know that people go a bit strange when the ozone layer goes away because ultraviolet can make you give you bad sunburn extreme ultraviolet more yeah but the earth's atmosphere protects us because it absorbs that radiation and our our phd thesis actually our, our sounding rocket experiment was measuring the number of electrons and positive ions and you all know what those are now as a function of height in the atmosphere and the energy in the electrons, as well as watching the extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun as a function of height. So theoretically, it went up as the, you know, when you got to the top, it was the full extreme ultraviolet and it hadn't been absorbed. And as you were coming up, you watched the effect of its absorption and it, it creates the ionosphere, which you may have heard of, the, the, the charged upper layers of the um, Earth's atmosphere. Okay. That's it. I'm geeked. All right, we're geeked. Right, I'm geeked. That's it. That's right. Okay. Well, maybe. So, when I worked for ASNE, American Science and Engineering, American Society in English, Giacconi had invented the first X ray telescope. Now, X rays, the longer wavelength, uh, sorry, the shorter wavelength radiation penetrates. I mean, you've all gone to have X rays now. You know it penetrates the outer layers of your body, and that's how they can see the uh, bones. Um, you can't really, um, you can't at all image it with standard imaging techniques, either reflective telescopes or lenses, because they absorb it. But if you've got sort of a tube and the x-rays come in like that, then you can image them. And Giacconi had invented the x-ray telescope. So when I got there, and I was known, by the way, as people's folly when they hired me, which pertains to people around and my boss. 
um, they put me in charge of data processing for the coming Skylab. And they also gave me a picture. And it wasn't quite like this, but but it was a bit like this. Uh, they had sent one of Giacone's telescopes up on a sounding rocket looking at the sun. And this is the sun in its hot outer layers. Those are loops which, which connect the sunspots. I said they connected and trapped the gas and rust, but this is where flares occur. And flares actually are, are, are shorts, electrical shorts, due to the messing about of the electron streams. Uh, and, and this is a coronal hole. So I say this because on Giacone's picture, there was a coronal hole down the middle. Now, we all knew about active regions and theoretically what they looked like, but we didn't know about coronal holes. And there was this darn big thing right in the middle of the picture. So while I was getting ready for Skylab, I also chatted with some friends of mine. I had a friend who measured solar wind outside the magnetosphere, and you all know all about that now, right? So he measured the charged particles from the sun, and I had another friend who measured the magnetic field on the surface of the sun, and then did theoretical extrapolations, uh, which we called Gordon's hairy billiard balls. And the nice thing about these two guys was that they had long-term records when I had a single record. So we thought, well, I wonder how long these things last. So we looked in the particles and saw that there was a spike in the particles, kind of corresponding to when this, this black thing went across the sun, uh, which meant that it was a, a surge in charged particles, but not like a flare where you get this massive surge. It was, it was big, but not huge. The thing about it, though, was that it was periodic. It went, came around every 27 years, which is the time that the, the 27 days, which is the time the sun takes to rotate. So every 27 days, one of these things would come along. And when every 27 days, Gordon's Herald billiard board showed an oh, outward hole. In, in the magnetic field. So we thought, okay, this is an open open magnetic field thing. It's correlated with the high speed streams coming in the, the solar wind. No one's figured that one out. So we wrote a paper. And that's how the scientific community started knowing me. Then I headed our group operating at Skylab. Now Skylab was in 73, 74. It was the first American space station. Uh, and it carried a group of solar telescopes on it called the Apollo Telescope Mount. And we had used Ciccone's, um X-ray telescope, for uh, our X-ray telescope. And there was another one from the NRL. There was a coronagraph from uh, um, Boulder, Colorado. Harvard, where my husband was working, had an extreme ultraviolet telescope. And you all know what extreme ultraviolet is, so that's fine. Uh, and I think there was another X-ray telescope, but looking at harder X-rays, which come from the flares, because of course, harder is hotter, and hotter comes from hotter gas. Okay, that's why I geeked. Yeah, just a little, yeah. yeah. I, Anyway, so uh, um, we would we, we would meet in Boulder to Oops. to do simulations, and the NASA folks. He's still here. Oh, got to put it back at the corner. How about that. Better. Okay. Right. Um, the 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 NASA folks were in the 70s. Your standard thing. They had the buzz cuts and the short sleeve formal shirts and ties and what we called a full Cleveland that they, they had their pocket their, their, protector a pocket protector with all, all Bill uh, Rinky knows about those um and uh, they were very straight laced and we were scientists so uh, um so my guys had long hair and 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 bare toes and stuff like that and we were always um being told about the, our dress codes uh Anyway, they said, well, we, we're not going to let people like you talk direct, directly to the astronauts. You're going to have to go through a science liaison and then through Capcom, and they will talk to the, yeah, the astronauts and tell them what to do with your telescopes, which were, by the way, photographic, because this was before digital uh, detectors became there, there were a lot of women in the room then too, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there were, well, I was going to tell you about that. See, there were about three of us. Mm -hmm. And... 
when they started getting on us about dress codes, we were wearing miniskirts and we put all our, we, we all had to have what we call frozen heads or shrunken heads, you know, uh, badges which let you into here and there and the other. So we put ours around the bottom of our miniskirts. <laughs> and you know, they never, they never grumbled about that. I'm not really sure why, but they, they didn't. But anyway, the thing is the rot set in and by the end of the third, it was, Skylab was run in three three-month sections with a couple of months in between. By the time, end of the third section, NASA was destroyed. The guys were growing their hair. They stopped wearing ties. You know, and we were allowed to talk to the astronauts. Mm -hmm. of, course, of course, it helped that by then we had Owen Garriott and Ed Gibson, who were scientists, and wanted to talk to us. So that was okay. Um, at the end of that, oh, I should say, because they had only wanted a single person to talk each time, the scientists had to get together and decide who they would allow to be representatives on each of the operating uh, shifts. And I was picked as one of the five. Each each experiment had one, and I I was the czar for. I was a representative of our experiment, but I was trusted to speak for the other four. Uh, if something bad happened or if something good happened on the sun, I knew what the others would want to do if there was a flare, for example. So, so they trusted me to be a czar, and that was that was quite a compliment, actually. But it meant that the solar physicists who were deeply involved in Skylab all knew me. Now, also after Skylab, we suddenly had nine months worth of pictures like this, and we could we could watch the coronal holes going across the sun, and we knew that they were long-lived five or six solar rotations, nearly months worth. Uh, and we we wrote our second paper saying that's what they were, and these the high-speed solar wind streams came from them, and yada, yada. Okay, so that's what got the scientists to recognize me. Uh, so when uh, a spot opened up at NASA headquarters for the chief of solar physics, and the community was asked who they'd like to represent them. They said me. And that was nice because my husband at the time, when I was working out of Boston and Houston for Skylab, my husband was doing the uh, sounding rocket calibration stuff for Harvard. And he was working out of Boulder and White Sands. And unfortunately, he had uh, developed a strong attachment to another lady, a woman. Mm -hmm person anyway uh and when we came we it, it all worked just fine through the years we weren't living together but suddenly skylab ended and there we were and that was not fun and i didn't feel like a menage a kashka so <laughs> when when nasa offered me the job uh i took it and i went to washington and became chief of solar physics and that was huge fun. But this is where I'm going to get a bit political. You know, whenever the, the US budget gets frozen, you think, oh, well, those, those bureaucrats are just going to have nothing to do. Well, us bureaucrats ran the American University science programs. Awesome. at NASA and the Natural Science Foundation and the Oceanic and um, Atmospheres Administration and the NIH and the rest of it are the ones who shovel the money out to the scientists in the universities. We have peer reviews, Every, you know, all proposals are peer reviews. We have scientific advisory committees that, that talk to you about the balance of the science, all that good stuff. But the fact is, what keeps the scientists in the universities working primarily are the, the, is government, and they rely on the money from Congress to fund them. So when you stop money to, to, to the government, you stop money to universities, and probably people don't know that, but I thought I'd tell you. <laughs> so anyway, I, I was, I don't know why, I was gradually promoted, so I then became, uh, the, the planner for solar terrestrial programs, which would, which then encompassed 
atmospheric and stuff like that, because of course I'd done the, the sounding rocket thing. And then I became, and I didn't put this in my resume because it sounds disgusting. The, the, the administrator of NASA is the administrator. The people who are in charge of the big bits like aeronautics and manned space flight and science and applications are the uh, associate administrators and their deputies are the assistant associate administrators. So I was an assistant associate administrator for space science, which meant I had planetary and atmospheric and all that, and life sciences all within my purview. But it just doesn't sound as interesting as chief of solar physics, so I didn't use it. Anyway, the big things there, I, there were three big things, really. I met my second husband, that's probably a real biggie, and I met him in China. We were on a science delegation. China was just opening up, and my boss, Noel Hinnis, the, the associate administrator, I said, didn't want to go. So he said, you're going to have to go, and what do you do? Yeah, yeah. so I did. Uh, and I thought it was going to be intensely boring because it was political. But um, there was this new guy, who'd come to NASA in charge of international affairs, which I think is a really funny title, because we were in China <laughs> and we got together. And uh, um, that was kind of that. That's when I met Ken. There was a guy who came here, love of my life and really smart, but not a scientist, a political scientist. And that meant we had complementary views, which was really nice. Um, Second thing that was really interesting when I was a uh, deputy for science was we went and briefed uh, President Carter and his lot on the flyby of Saturn, uh, the Voyager flyby of either Saturn or Jupiter. I think it was Saturn because of the rings. But anyway, we, we trolled along to the White House. The, 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 the NASA administrator at the time was Bob Frosch, and Bob Frosch and I went along. And um, everybody was there, and the signals were supposed to come in. The new pictures of the satellites were supposed to come of, of the planet and its satellites were supposed to come through at about nine o'clock. So we had the the telelink set up with the Jet Propulsion Lab, and we were waiting, and it didn't come. And so we started having to tap dance, you know. And you, in front of the president, you feel a bit silly about this, but you, you start talking about the planets and things. And my opposite number, Jet Propulsion Lab, with whom I was talking, had an accent kind of like mine. And at some point, Carter said to Bobby Frosch, why does he... Why does the Brits pay such a big part in our space program? <laughs> and Frosch said, I'm sorry, but they're actually ours. Because I, I was an American citizen from 78. So, you know, I was technically an American, just the accent wasn't. Anyway, finally, the, the, the pictures came in about half an hour late. And the reason they did would not happen today. But the signal from the spacecraft came into Canberra in Australia. And Canberra sent them on through a, a, a communication satellite to Jet Propulsion Lab that sent them to us. Uh, and unfortunately, the JPL guys had forgotten that Canberra had to rewind its tapes before they sent them on. So there was a half hour rewind before they sent the. So finally, of course, the pictures came and you all saw the, the, the Viking pictures and they were lovely so you know they all was well in the end but it was kind of embarrassing uh oh third thing again vaguely political uh one of the places i had oversight on when i was doing that job was some place called goddard institute for space studies in new york which specialized in atmospheric studies and among other things they did models of the atmosphere and that was where james hansen did his atmospheric models that showed that we were in deep trouble because carbon dioxide was building up in the atmosphere and we were facing eventually a um, greenhouse situation. And, and we were and what year was that? Oh, that was More in like... about 77-ish. Okay. Uh, and we were told not to talk about it. In fact, Jim's travel budget was cut. We were told by the administration that we couldn't talk about it. Uh, and that went on really 
um, administration after administration, so this is not that political, until the Clinton years when Al Gore called it, and I think brilliantly, an inconvenient truth. Because it was, because it was, if any of you read the Federalist Papers, it's the tragedy of the commons. One country couldn't solve it, and there was no way on earth that you were going to get everybody to. So that it was only when the effects started being really apparent that the administration came clean and started talking about global warming and the rest of it, which many people still didn't understand, except the scientists did because we'd been measuring the uh, um, pile up, the, 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 the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere for years. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that, those were those three big things when I was chief of soil physics, no, when I was deputy chief of science. Then I hit a glass ceiling because I was 10 years too young and the wrong sex for the next job. My, my boss, Noel Hinners, went to be the director of the Air and Space Museum. And I, I was told by the deputy administrator of NASA that he couldn't do it to me. It was too tough a job. So I, I could either fight it, which ends up with you being bitter and twisted, or just go. So I, I went, they, they sent me to Goddard Space Flight Center, and I spent a miserable couple of years in the application program. Miserable because the application program had been given to Noah and we had nothing to do. And then Jaconi called me, and he remembered me from when I worked for ASNE because I had written a proposal which brought $4 million into ASNE for data processing for our Skylab. So he invited me to join the, the newly formed, but not yet fleshed out Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, for which he was going to be the director. Because as he said, I spoke fluent NASA. <laughs> so I went and joined him. I was director of programs for about four years until we got it all built up. NASA had this confused idea of actually operating the space telescope from Goddard and just allowing some of the data to the Space Telescope Institute, a, um, a, an idea which in Giacone's uh, way of talking, he, he disagreed 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. So he then fought to have both operations and data analysis at the Institute, and eventually that's what we did. And I just helped him make the case and bring the money in and get all that sorted. When we'd finished that, actually, the... the, the um, the uh, Hubble telescope was postponed because of the first Challenger, because of the first shuttle um, crash. But but we were already at that time, and I left AS. Uh, I left the, the 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 space telescope institute and went to join a Beltway Bandit consulting firm. And I went as an analyst, and again, I sort of maundered my way up because I could write neat proposals. A neat proposal at that level meant about $10 million a time, and I managed to do a few of those. So I ended up with a group of about 70 people and the title of um, Senior Vice President for Science and Technology. And, you know, um, but just about... I don't know, the, the, the late 80s it was, the people who had formed the company, Braddock, Dunn and McDonald, BDNM, retired. They decided they wanted to cash out and they sold us. And they sold us to one of these financial types who sort of bought companies, you know, uh, without knowing too much about them. So he bought ours and he bought Fairchild Aerospace because he thought that was a good, good coupling. It was actually horrible because my lot were um, helping Na NASA write specifications for requests for proposals against which Fairchild would bid. And that's called a conflict of interest. Mm. So for two years, I had I had these 70 people, neat people. One of them had an ALS and, you know, I, I, I loved them all. And I had to keep them working. And NASA kept trying to close us down. And I had to work with the lawyers to form what is called in business Chinese walls. 
walls that, that separate us in, from Fairchild in this particular case. And it was miserable. They required lots of documentation. And I lost 20 pounds. And my, my health went to hell in a handbasket. And I had a lovely deputy. So at the end of the time, we, we made a case to management that this whole operation was awful. Because I wasn't the only part of AS, uh, BDM who had this problem. So then they, uh, um, they, this guy sold us again to the Carlisle group and we were allowed to split off and go independently. But my health was such that it wasn't a good idea for me. So I retired and then my deputy took over my, my group. And then, so I retired at 50. And my father who had believed strongly in education said, why did you retire? And I said, well, I've been doing physics in one form or another until I was 50. Now I'm going to do all those other things you told me I could do when I finished doing my physics. So I started playing tennis. Eh, I, I went from 2-5 to 3-5, but I'm a real, real um, coward at the net. If people hit the ball to me, I, I, I tried playing golf. Awful, absolutely awful. Did ceramics. I enjoyed that. And ran a uh, um, a not-for-profit uh, organization on the Eastern Shore called, um, called Christmas in April. And it's a poor man's habitat. We would collect money and volunteers, and the last Sunday in April, we'd go and fix the houses of poor homeowners, and we would get the na names from the Department of Aging in our county, which was Queen Anne's County. So we worked closely with them, and that was fun. I I, I couldn't wield a paintbrush very well, but I actually could really wield a computer. So I wrote the begging letters, and we we got the the restaurants to contribute food for the day, and I would make these these neat placards with the picture of the house they'd sponsored, and all, yeah. and I would do spreadsheets so that all the volunteers came in, and I'd put their skills, and I'd get with the guys who did the real work and allocate the volunteers to the houses, and and that was good for a while, and then then we fully re retired and went to Sun City, and then eventually came here. And eventually came here. And eventually came here, yeah. That's right. We're almost out of time. I'm afraid. I, I, I... This has been a very easy interview. That's like, all I can say. Uh, yeah. I, I did that last time. Jean said she just pointed me in. The, it was sort of like Capelia's doll. You know, you wind them up. But it's and kind let... of fun that way. Yeah. 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 And, and you and I could sit here and talk for hours. Yeah, we're not going to tell them about what we were talking about. No, we won't. No. That would be bad. Yeah. But we will we will give you an opportunity to ask some questions. And we've got Carolyn and Bill. And the only thing we'd ask is that you wait until you have the microphone until you ask your question. Margot, right here. You haven't gotten to your painting. Well, I, I thought you all knew about that. No, when I came here, I came here quite early because my husband, Ken, had developed a really, really bad sleep disorder in which he just didn't sleep at all. And we had been traveling widely, both for business and for pleasure. And we had intended to go on doing it, and we couldn't. So um, we were quite upset, and a psychiatrist I talked to said, well, you're going to have to find a way to, to, to get around that. So I went to her class, her, Katie McCloy, it's all her fault, uh, and she taught me how to do, uh, do watercolor. If, well, I, actually, what she said is you can do what you like, once, yeah, and she showed how to mix colors and stuff like that. Uh, and I started painting the places that I would like to go back to. And we first all, we, we didn't have masses of photos because we'd done most of our traveling before digital photography came in. So only our last couple of trips did we have digital. But of course, the internet's wonderful. And there's, there are sites like Shutterstock where you can go on and say, I feel like going to Paris. And you can go to Paris and see all these photographs. How about a, a, a restaurant on the left bank? There you go. And you can buy them. You, you download it for a small fee. It used to be $5, now it's 10 still small. Uh, and then you can paint it. So I started painting the places that I'd like to be visiting and couldn't. And that, that's the me you know now. And I also play guitar. I play in a trio 
with him and with where is she there yes right yes there. and jean jean back there so jean nancy and david uh we and we play uh in assisted living and in healthcare, and sometimes outside the dining room and that's the other bit of me and your your paintings are very detailed tell us about that why do you make them so detailed with a history like that how could they be otherwise no i mean it's partly partly because it's a way to see what's going on yourself. Partly it's because it's tough enough to get rid of 12 paintings a year, but can you imagine if you just put them out once every few days? I mean, the, the, the pines would now be high in, in paintings, you know? So I, I just enjoy being there and that's why I do it. Questions? Yes. Well, I can say I'm a proud owner <laughs> of several of your paintings, and you're such a technician. I mean, oh my gosh, I think there I counted 35 people in one of the paintings. Yes. And every face and every piece of clothing is different. And it's it's your technical eye that is just so amazing. You know, worse than that with the people, I have to figure out how things work. And I, I did a painting of Portofino where they had strings cross holding up the uh, um, the, 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 the uh, shades over the shops. Uh, and I didn't want the strings, but I couldn't leave it as was because nothing was holding up the shades, right? So I, I put in sort of bars from the, from the other side to hold the shades up because as a scientist, I couldn't possibly paint it without something holding the shades. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Other questions? All right, we'll end on that. And just wanted to let you know that the next session of Interesting Lives will be Monday, July 10th. So not next week, but the following week at 1030. And our interviewee will be Vernon Baker, oh. the, the oh. Pine CEO and my doubles cornhole partner. So. Ah. Please join us on July 10th. Thank you. It's great. That was great. I'm sorry. Once I get going. My mind dropped.